best. So we're going to continue on the same uh, kind of where we left off and uh, talking about the, the role of riparian vegetation. And you'll recall the triangle uh, that dictates sort of what goes on in a riparian area. And Ryan did a good job of talking about the water into that triangle, the hydrology, and the soil sediment side, that big word that he used, geomorphology. So we're going to close the triangle and talk about how vegetation uh, interacts with both of these factors in the riparian area. And this is the part that landowners can sink their teeth into better because as landowners, you have control over the vegetation in your creek bottom. You don't really have direct control over the hydrology and some of the sediment dynamics. And so here we go. There are two functional groups of riparian plants that it's important to understand, colonizers and stabilizers. And in many parts of Texas, <clears throat> more so in the hill country, colonizer plants are pretty important because they are the very first plants to establish in freshly deposited sediment. So anytime you have a fresh sediment deposit or a disturbed area, a bare area, a bare sand, these are the first plants to come in. And they have the capacity to spread and reproduce very rapidly, oftentimes by rooting at sto with stolons or uh, rhizomes. And these are not strong rooted plants. These are not the plants that stand up to floods but their role in the system is just to put as much plant cover down as quickly as possible on those fresh, bare areas. And for that reason, especially in the more dynamic systems, more so in the hill country than here in the Blacklands, they're critical uh, for the recovery of degraded systems. Stabilizers, on the other hand, as the name implies, are the big, strong, robust plants. These are the plants that can stand up to the high energy flows. And here we're talking about uh, 10, 20, 30 year events, perhaps 50 year events. That's how strong rooted they are. Very, very strong, deep, binding, reinforcing root systems. And so these are the plants that dissipate energy and protect those banks during the high flow, during these floods that come through. Here's just a, one example of a bank that's very well stabilized. That combination of vegetation, which has both woody plants and non-woody plants, is holding that bank together perfectly in a very flash flood, high energy type system. We have attempted to assign a numerical rating to estimate just how strong rooted are some of these plants. And so on a scale of one to 10, with one being very weak rooted and 10 being is, uh, equivalent to large anchored boulders or large anchored logs. And across Texas, we have found that a rating of six or seven is usually good enough to provide that basic level of riparian function. Not all plants have to be a nine or a 10. In the hill country, where we have higher energies, we really want to see a rating of seven or higher. But in the Blacklands, in North Texas, in East Texas, where the energies are a little bit lower, we're saying that a rating of six or higher is generally considered good enough to hold banks in place, to dissipate energy, to do those things we're talking about. And so in your riparian field guide, you're going to see that numerical stability rating on each of the plants. And you can take that book home, begin to learn your plants, and then learn, well, how strong rooted is it? Is it more of a colonizer? Is it more of a stabilizer? There's another bit of information that's important for you to understand about riparian plants. Every plant in the U.S. has been assigned one of five wetland indicator categories, which describe how much wetness, how much water do plants need, how much wetness do they tolerate, and basically where do they grow? Do they grow in a dry location or a wet location? 
And so beginning with the wettest category down to the driest, the first one are called obligate wetland plants. These are plants that have to grow in wet environments. They cannot survive in dry environments. And we abbreviate that called OBL. The next group are called facultative wetland plants. And they usually grow in wet locations, but sometimes, occasionally, you're going to see these plants grow in a bit of a drier location. And so we're going down the gradient from wet to dry. In the middle category are called facultative plants. We abbreviate it FAC. And this information is also in your field guide. The reason that facultative plants are important is because they are equally happy to grow in wet locations or in dry locations. They're sort of crossover plants. They like the water, just like most plants do, but they can tolerate long periods of dryness. And so in drought-prone areas like Texas, it's really important that we have some facultative plants to hold things together during our long droughts. The other two categories are mostly the upland species, you know, mesquite, side oats, grandma, uh, cedar, some of these plants that grow up on the uplands. And so these are the three categories of plants that we consider the true riparian plants. Now the reason we even put this information up here, it's not just botanical trivia for you to learn, but we use this information as indicators of what's happening in the riparian area. So for example, if you have a riparian area that's dominated by obligate and facultative wetland plants, that tells you something. That tells you that you're storing water underground because those plants have to have that water table so that you don't have to go dig a hole with a post hole digger and see if water seeps in you can just identify what plants you have, and if they're obligate or facultative wetland plants, the plants are telling you you've got a riparian sponge, you're storing water, you've got a water catching environment. On the other hand, if your riparian area is dominated by more of the upland plants, then that's telling you you're not storing water. So we use it just as an indicator. And here's how we use these, this type of information. We look at the riparian area, we begin to identify some of the plants that are dominant, and we know their stability rating, and we know their wetland indicator category, and it helps us interpret what's going on. So let me walk you through this one. In this case, we have black willow, switchgrass, emery sedge, and some watercress down here. The fact that we have some plants rated seven, nine, and nine tell us that we have a plant community that's strong rooted. It can stand up to floods, 10, 20, 30 year flood events, and, and it, they can still dissipate the energy. They're not gonna get washed out. The fact that we have some plants that are obligates, obligate, in fact wet, that tells us that we are storing water underground. And at this location, we're some 30, 40, 50 feet away from the main channel. We're back on the floodplain, but there's water underground. There's a high water table. We're storing water. We have a riparian sponge because that's what it takes to sustain obligates and facultative wetland plants. The fact that we have a facultative species in there, switchgrass, means that we have a plant species that can withstand dryness. If we lose our water table, if we have an extended drought, and that water table starts receding and it stays dry, switchgrass is very resilient. It can hang in there during those dry times. So this is how we use this information. I'm going to show you just some examples of some of the plants we encounter in Central Texas. Most of my experience is west of here, more in the hills, and so you'll probably see some plants uh, that I show you that you may or may not have right here in your county. But here's a picture of some colonizers. This is watercress and water pennywort. They're weak rooted, but they spread very quickly. They cover that bare ground. That's their job. That's what God made them to do. Catching that very fine sediment that flows through, setting the stage for the growth of the more 
stronger stabilizer plants. And then there's a group of plants that I didn't mention, actually. They're sort of a hybrid function, not grass as an example, of a group of plants that have some characteristics of colonizers, but also have some moderately good stabilizing strength. And so you'll see the stability rating is six. And this is all one plant of knotgrass. It's not a hundred different plants. They're all interconnected by a common root system. And so you can imagine this intermeshing, reinforcing root system, the rhizomes and the stolons and the runners of knotgrass making a pretty good riparian plant. There's the rhizomes of knotgrass, probably similar to what you see with Bermuda grass. There's the runners running across that fresh sediment, putting down roots every few inches. It'll crawl across the rocks like you see here. It'll even grow out into the water. So it's a pretty versatile riparian plant. There's what the seed head looks like. It's a V-shaped seed head. And then there's another type of plant we call spike rushes, and there are many kinds of spike rush in Texas, but they're also sort of this hybrid of a colonizer slash stabilizer. Notice sort of a high mid-range stability rating. Most spike rushes are obligate. You, there's the uh, familiar seed heads. You've probably seen that if you've walked up and down your creeks very much. And then there's a plant that most of you are perhaps familiar with. It's called bushy blue stem. It stands about waist high. But notice, the stability rating is sort of <clears throat> on the low side. It's only about a five. We really consider it more of a colonizer. Even though it's a big plant, its roots are not all that strong. But if you look at the seed heads there, how would you suspect those seed are dispersed naturally? They're fluffy seed. It's dispersed by the wind. So winds whipping up and down those creeks, reseeding the seed up and down. And so that the, one of the primary benefits of bushy blue stem is its ability to reseed itself naturally. And so it's very common on some creeks to see uh, hundreds and hundreds of feet of these bare gravel bars, fresh new gravel bars, being naturally reseeded by bushy blue stem. And six months from now or a year from now, it's going to be a solid mat of, of, uh, of grass. Now we want to talk about some of the true stabilizer plants. This one is called, this is the switchgrass that I mentioned earlier. Notice the stability rating. It's a facultative plant. It's a, st it's a stabilizer of good, strong roots. It grows in the rocks. It grows in the sand. It's, it grows in a lot of places. There's your familiar seed head. It's up over my head in height, big strong plant. But what we like about it is its root system, really, really strong roots. You can't pull those up without a, a machine of some sort. They're that strong rooted. And here's just a picture of one lonely switchgrass plant. Well, there's actually several, one here, one here, one here, but holding little chunks of soil in place. And just think about if that entire floodplain was occupied by switchgrass instead of individual clumps. Just look how much soil could have been saved. Same thing here, holding a bank together against some really high energy. One big switchgrass plant, again, showing how strong those roots are to hold soil and sediment in place. Another stabilizer which you have in this area is called eastern gamma grass. Notice the stability rating, very high. It's also a facultative plant, so it can, it can withstand some dry weather. It doesn't have to be sub-irrigated. It doesn't have to have high water table all the time. One of the things about eastern gamma grass is that it grows very well in the shade. Most grasses want to be in the sun, but gamma grass will do quite well under moderate shade. And there's one individual plant. You know, these plants are three to five foot across, and over six foot tall, so they're big, big, strong plants. There are many, many species of sedge in Texas. 
and this is just happens to be the one that's very important in, in sort of central Texas, more in the hill country in North Texas, but it forms these long linear colonies right at the water's edge with these long leaves drooping out. Again, notice that it's an obligate plant, very strong stability rating. There's what the seed head looks like. I don't know how common it is here in the Blacklands. I have not seen it right around here. You do have some species of bulrush around here. The seed heads vary in their look from this to this, but notice strong stability. They're obligate plants. Here's a little creek down uh, near Victoria, and it's being held together largely by bulrush. That's what this is right along here. Strong rooted, forming colonies. And the way that bulrush spreads is by these underground rhizomes. So you have these strong rhizomes the size of your little finger putting down roots every few inches, putting up new plants every few inches. So you can see what kind of good uh, stabilizing uh, network of roots would be produced with bulrush. And then here's a plant that's we call this a forb or a, just a herbaceous plant. It's not a grass, it's more of a broadleaf called water willow. Pretty good stability rating. It's obligate. It grows actually out in the water. Uh, very strong binding root system. There's a close-up of it. I suspect you're familiar with it if you've been around creeks much, much of your life. And now I want to share with you some statistics which you might find almost unbelievable. This graph depicts the number of miles of root that are contained in one cubic foot of soil. So first, try to picture one cubic foot of soil. And we're going to contrast upland plants with riparian plants. And the first thing to notice is how much more densely rooted riparian plants are than their counterparts in the uplands. We're talking about 10, 20, 30 times more root in the same volume of soil. And then the other thing to notice is just the un, almost the unbelievable length of roots. It's hard to, it's hard to imagine, you know, seven miles of root, eight, much less 18 or 20 plus miles of root in one cubic foot with some of these riparian species. But what you can do to picture that and I'm thinking here about spike rush with 22 miles of root. That's the same root density. If you go home and if you will uh, unwind 67 feet of thread or fishing line and wad it up into a one inch ball, visually you can see how much root density exists because that's the same equivalent 67 feet of root in one cubic inch. And then here's some other data that's sort of similar, but except this one is the pounds of root per acre. Underground roots comparing upland plants to riparian plants. And again, just noticing that here we have 12 tons, uh, nearly 24 tons, over 30 tons of root material underground holding the floodplains and banks in place. And so riparian plants are different. They're different than upland plants. They have stronger roots. They have more roots. And now we want to talk about the value and role of woody plants because especially in this part of Texas and in other parts of Texas, it's primarily woody plants that are holding things together, that are dissipating energy, that are protecting the banks. Related to the earlier discussion of beavers, this picture was taken at Junction, but there's a little beaver dam right there. So Ryan is correct that in that most beavers in the hill country are bank dwelling beavers, but there are beaver dams even in the hill country. But they gotta be pretty good engineers to hold up to the floods that happen. Anyway, uh, the importance of woody plants. I'd never cease to be amazed at how well that the roots of trees and bushes 
can reinforce these creek banks. It's literally amazing to look into a bank at low water level and see just the sheer amount of root mass. If you try to get a shovel or a pick and dig into that bank, you can't do it. It's totally reinforced by roots. Big roots, little roots, going way back down into the bank and a long way, uh, not just downward, but uh, laterally. And so some of the plants that we know to be important, riparian stabilizers, this is our most common species of willow. It's black willow. Again, notice pretty good stability rating. It's a facultative wet species. And this picture simply shows one lonely willow tree holding that, that whole little point in place. And you can imagine that if there had been willows all up and down here, then this big area would, have been, would be a lot more stable. But with only with grasses, it's, it's washed out. But that one willow tree is valiantly trying to hold on to the bank. Cottonwood, similar st stability rating, uh, important in some parts of Texas. And then we have our common native maple tree that grows in riparian areas. It's called box elder maple, and we will probably see it this afternoon. It's an important riparian stabilizer in the Blacklands and in North Texas and other places. There are several species of oaks that serve pretty well as uh, riparian stabilizing plants. This happens to be bur oak with the giant acorns, but um, live oak and water oak and willow oak and others all have these pretty good stability ratings of around six or so. Several species of elm add into the, uh, the stability of these banks. This is American elm. We also have cedar elm and slippery elm and a few others. And this is the lower Frio River down in South Texas. And it doesn't look visually maybe as pretty as some of our hill country creeks. But the trees, uh, the roots of Mexican ash and cedar elm are completely and perfectly holding those banks in place. That's a very, very stable channel. And the water in this Frio River definitely gets all the way up here on this floodplain, you know, every year, sometimes twice a year. So there's a lot of energy, a lot of water moving through here, and the roots of those trees are holding those banks in place. So don't think that you have to have sedges and switchgrass and uh, eastern gamma grass. Many, many, many miles of creeks in Texas are held in place simply by the roots of trees. Sycamore is an important tree in some places. It grows very well in those deep, uh, sterile-looking gravel deposits, and that's the primary plant that was shown in uh, the photo points on the Nueces River. You'll see here that this is one lone sycamore tree, and you can see that it's trying to hold that bank in place. It could really use some help with some other plants. Normally, if we just have one or two species, we're not going to have as much stability as if we had some grasses and sedges and other shrubs growing along with that. Of course, bald cypress is perhaps the ultimate riparian stabilizer. Um, you know, there's no engineer on the earth who could design a bank reinforcing system any better than what we see with the roots of those of this one this one cypress tree producing all of this bank protection so it's truly an amazing plant for those areas where it grows here's a common riparian shrub that you may have seen it's called button bush and this one is not a tree it's more of a bush it has those funny looking white uh, flowers but notice the good stability rating it's an obligate plant it can really hold banks together Indigo bush amorpha is another shrub. It only grows, uh, you know, six to eight foot tall, but it has good, strong uh, reinforcing roots. Uh, there are several species of walnut that also are, contribute to holding banks, holding floodplains in place. 
And then there's a plant that uh, many Texans really, they dislike baccarus a lot. You'll hear this one called by various names, uh, Roosevelt weed, dryland willow, um, if there's some other names, that it, but it's not very well liked. But down in the riparian area, it's doing an important job. It's helping to dissipate energy. It's kind of considered an early stabilizer. Moderate stability rating, and sometimes it grows weedy looking and people don't really like it, but we have found that the growth of Baccarus is a stage that many of these creeks have to go through before they're going to get any better. So the analogy we could use is that if you had a severe flesh wound on your arm or leg and it begins to heal up, it has a big scab in the healing process, and if you try to rip off that scab every time it forms, you, it's never going to heal up. Well, you, you know that. And it's the same way when we try to remove Baccarus off of a floodplain. It's your you would be actually retarding the restoration process. And so there's some plants that come in and are short-lived and they do that initial job of providing some cover in the early stages of healing. Well, this is a picture of a tree root right on uh, Plum Creek. It happens to be box elder maple. Well, we know that trees are important when they're alive because they have these roots that reinforce the banks but the other side to that is that even when trees die, even when they fall into the creek, when they get washed into the creek, they're still very important, even though they're dead. And we call this, and Ryan talked about, large wood, or large woody debris. When these trees fall into the channel, when they lodge onto the banks, and they, become, they begin to be partly buried up, Large wood should be retained in your creeks and rivers. It's usually a mistake to try to drag that wood out of there. That's been the history uh, throughout Texas as people thought that, that these trees and logs was clogging up the creeks, and so they pulled them out and they burned them. And I've done it myself before I learned that it was the wrong thing to do. But notice what large wood is doing, especially when the root wad is still attached, forms an anchor, and the tree begins to dissipate energy. When you dissipate energy, you begin to trap sediment. When sediment starts to be trapped, you grow vegetation. And here's just a close-up of that same log showing the sediment, showing the vegetation. That log is starting to form a bank of its own. It's going to get buried up. And these logs that are buried in the sediments last an incredibly long time. We're talking centuries, that wood stays intact. And so even though this may not be pretty to your eyes, it's really an important part of riparian function. Dissipating energy, slowing down the water, trapping sediment. And this is true also on the floodplains, where these logs get lodged out on the floodplain. They're doing the same thing. So we advise people and ask people to leave that wood Leave those logs in place. Here's another picture of Plum Creek from a workshop we had two or three years ago. That's what creeks like. And so Ryan's motto, wood is good, is one we believe in. If you're going to be walking up and down your creek to evaluate the vegetation, I'm going to give you seven things to be looking for to evaluate is your vegetation uh, doing the job it's supposed to do. First, you want to look for multiple age classes, especially on woody plants, to indicate to you that reproduction is taking place. And so we're not just looking for the nice mature trees, we're also specifically looking to see if we have young trees. For plants that spread by rhizomes, we're looking to see are those colonies expanding in, in dimension. That's how they reproduce. For plants like switchgrass, we're noticing the big mature plants, but we also want to take note, are there young plants that are forming in the gaps in between to fill in those spaces over time? 
Secondly, we want to be looking for a diversity of vegetation. Normally, a riparian area will be more stable and more functional when we have a variety of plant life, not just one or two species. Thirdly, we want to be looking for those plants that indicate that we're storing water, specifically uh, obligate and facultative wet species, which show us that we have a riparian sponge working underground. And that, to me, that picture shows a large, wet water table or riparian sponge helping to sustain that creek. And here's a picture that comes from the hill country, a poor, kind of a sad looking picture, but how much of a riparian sponge do you see depicted there? There's no visual signs that we're storing any water underground because these are actually upland plants growing right next to the water's edge. On both sides, they're upland plants. So it tells us, hey, something's not right here. We're not holding, storing water in the ground. And then we want to be looking for plants that have high stability ratings, plants that are rated at least a seven or uh, at least a six, say in the Blacklands, but seven or higher in the hill country. And if we have those plants that, are, that have good stability ratings, we can be assured that we're dissipating energy, we're protecting banks, we can stand up to high flow events. And if we don't have strong stabilizing plants, then we will oftentimes see signs of active bank erosion. And when your creeks have this scalloped appearance, that's a sure sign that there's instability and there's chunks of bank that are caving off, falling in the creek. And then we want to pay attention to plant vigor. How healthy visually do the plants look? And the reason this is important is because what we see above ground as we look at a plant reflects how good the root system is. And so this picture simply illustrates the relationship between the top growth of the leaves and what's underground. And I think we would all agree that we want our riparian plants to have good, deep, binding root systems as you see pictured here. But if we have some kind of disturbance or hindrance whether it be cattle, or axis deer, or weed eaters, or kids tromping up and down the bank to where we compromise the top growth and get it mowed or grazed too short, then you can see what happens to the root system. That kind of use, that kind of disturbance, stunts and shrinks the root system. And therefore, we don't have the bank stability and the, that, we, that we need. And so if you have a plant that should be growing knee high and it's chronically grazed to a few inches, you can just imagine what the root system is going to look like. And it's not going to be able to stand up to the high energy flows. We also look at the plant vigor on woody plants. And now we're thinking primarily of animals which browse. So we're thinking goats, white-tailed deer, exotics that have a detrimental effect on woody plants. But it could also be uh, someone with an over-aggressive weed eater or mowing practices. And so it's just a visual appraisal. Do the plants generally look healthy or does the vigor look compromised? Is there something going on where those plants are really not healthy and leafy and deep-rooted? And then we look for a certain threshold of coverage of vegetation. And specifically, we want to see 70% coverage of stabilizing riparian vegetation on each bank. Now here, of course, I have pictured more of a, a grass and sedge vegetation. But in this area, it's going to be looking more at the woody plants, specifically trying to consider how much root is you know, impregnating those banks. And again, it's just a visual appraisal. It's just not highly scientific. It's just a visual assessment of do I have at least 70% coverage or am I lacking? That's the threshold that's been established for meeting that minimum basic level of functionality. And then lastly, 
we want to be looking at is there a source of trees growing that someday 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now when they die, when they wash out, they will become a source of large wood. So here we're not so much looking at the wood that's already in the channel, but we're looking back up on the bank. Are there trees growing nearby that someday will become that source of large wood? So we're looking a long way into the future. So wood is good. Leave it in place. It's providing valuable function. So here's the seven vegetation indicators that you can look for. Multiple age classes, plant diversity, plants that in indicate wet conditions, plants with good stabilizing root systems, good plant vigor, 70% coverage, and a source of trees growing that can someday be converted into large wood. And so basically, if we had to summarize the role of vegetation, it's simply, again, dissipating energy, helping to reduce erosion, helping to trap that sediment. The sediment is what is able to store water and create that riparian sponge. And in one statement, really, whether we're talking uplands or riparian areas, the job of land stewardship is to help slow down the water. The slower that water travels downhill, the more time it has to soak in. And the more water that soaks in, the more water can come out later as base flow and springs and aquifer recharge. And so this is the slide I end with here because it shows the challenge that we have in Texas to educate people as to what is a healthy, functional riparian area. There's still a lot of people in Texas that think that this is a nice looking, this is the way a riparian area, a creek bottom should look. It's all manicured. You can have a nice picnic there. You can even play golf there, but it's not a healthy, functional riparian area. So we're trying to teach people that this is really what more of what we're looking for. It can be pretty wild and woolly. A riparian area that's healthy is going to be hard to walk through. 